So, my Dharma brothers and sisters and friends, today I'm going to give a talk about uh, more Dharma, less drama. <laughs> Quite a title. <laughs> How to make wholesome and awesome decisions in life. Yes. Uh, when it comes to making decisions, let us start with the, uh, the Buddha. You know the decision the Buddha had to make? Well, uh, those days when the Buddha came, there were 62 views. 62 views about whether the world is eternal, in external, or both, what happened to an arahant, uh, to, uh, what happened to a Tathagata after the death. So there are so many questions. And some of them were metaphorical questions, metaphysics. And uh, of course, the Buddha came up with the Dharma. And his Dharma is the middle path. Because all the 60 views, uh, really, you can bunch them into either uh, internalism or externalism. In other words, uh, self mortification that's one, was one view. People uh, standing on one leg for the entire life to attain enlightenment. And also on the other side, there was uh, uh, what we call sen uh, sense indulgence, where people thought that if you indulge in senses, oh, and then you at that's when you attain Nibbana. So the Buddha had to make a few decisions, and what is very interesting, that he, he followed self-mortification for six, six years. How about that for decision-making? <laughs> And tested for himself and found out, well, this doesn't lead to an enlightenment. And guess what? Also, he went to also to uh, practice also self-indulgence. <laughs> and then he said, no, that, there must be a way. So he had to make decisions, the Buddha. Had to make a decision. Another decision the Buddha made, uh, of course, the decision he made was to teach the Noble Eightfold Path. It was a very interesting decision. Of course, uh, we find decisions of the Buddha regarding uh, whether he's going to teach or not. After he got enlightened, and he, he enjoyed uh, this bliss of Nibbana, ultimate happiness. And then according to the story, he said, oh, you know, should I go teach? Oh, these people are not going to understand the Dharma. Uh, I better enjoy myself. <laughs> Until and, <laughs> some kind of Brahmin uh, appeared to him and say, no, there are people with little dust. Oh, yeah, okay, how are you going to teach? So we, in the life of the Buddha, we see decision-making. So maybe that's uh, something that long time ago, let's bring it our life. Do you make decisions? I think so. The decision to come here. In my life, I've made decisions, and I saw exactly how they affected my life. As far as I remember, of course, I don't remember choosing to be born. <laughs> that one I don't remember. But I'll tell you what I remember very clearly. I don't know whether I was three years at home. Uh, they were building our house, and there's a shed. And we liked playing with all our siblings. And our best play was to climb on a shed on the top of the building and play from there as if the ground was not enough. Can you imagine? <laughs> so we put a ladder, and then we climb. Of course, that's the time when my father's not there. He's gone, gone, gone to work. So we play around, we play around. And we know when dad comes back, usually it's around six, seven. But this particular day, my dad came back at three. And he had told us not to ever play on the, on the, on the top of the roof. So all of us, we are on the top, all the children. As soon as the kids, other, my siblings saw the, my dad driving in, they, go, they went down, of course, via the ladder, and then they ran away. And I was left there alone on the top. Can you imagine? <laughs> I looked around for them. They are quick because they were older than me. I looked around. All of them were gone. And my father was pulling in a driveway. So what can I do? You know the decision I made is to jump. <laughs> I, I didn't even use a ladder. <laughs> when I jumped, uh, uh, I reached, on, of course, the ground, and my hand turned this way like this. 
my hand turned like this. So now I'm telling you, I cried, and then they took me to a very, very senior lady who's a, a chiropractor. Even up to now, I can see her image, I'm telling you. I was going through a lot of pain. She used a lot of G, they put around G, uh, like this, and then she pulled it like this, and then it will pop, it will pop back. <laughs> I hated that lady. <laughs> I'm telling you seriously. I was very young. I hated that lady. Every time my, my, my mother said that we are going to a chiropractor, I would cry. I would cry until I had no tears. <laughs> of course, later on, maybe it took almost two months, and then I came back to normal. But every time I looked at the heights, I felt trembling like this. It's called thrill, thrill fear. Every time I was like that. So I made a very bad decision, really. I mean, if I stayed on a, on, a, on a shed, the worst case scenario is my father will come and tell me off. Why did I subject myself to such a terrible thing, you know? So that was a clear uh, uh, call for me that we can make decision out of fear. That decision was based on fear. Very clearly, I can tell. So we make decision based on fear. We make decision based on attachment. Decision based on aversion. Decision based on ignorance. So let's look at uh, how we make decision. I think uh, uh, how to use this one. Okay, let's see. I, I developed a PowerPoint because there are so many points to, to see here. And this is not my computer. I will see how it goes. I don't know why I made this decision. <laughs> this is another decision. I would have brought my computer. <laughs> Okay, so do I click like this? Okay, these are the things we're going to see. Hmm? Where is it? Yeah. My computer clicks better than this. <laughs> okay, 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 good, good. Okay, well, introduction. Okay, uh -huh, two kinds of decisions. Then why people make unwholesome decisions. We are going to see decision-making process. We are going to also to... Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to talk about examination stage, which is the differences between wholesome and wholesome states of mind. And then we are going to see a case study and then a conclusion. Wow, I hope we have time for that. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> All right, this is actually very, very important because we make a decision about marriage, a decision about job, about this. So this is not a very simple matter. That's why I prepared even a PowerPoint <laughs> Uh, to show these things so that maybe you can refight later on, all right? So let us find out, uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so let us first define a few words there, right? There's the word dharma or dharma. Literally, actually, dharma, the word dharma means to, to uphold. It comes from the verb called dara, uh, root, it's dara. It means to uphold, to support. So it means nature, truth, justice, normal, teaching of the Buddha, order, laws of nature. So when I talk about more dharma, means more justice, more according to the truth, actually. That's what it means. Then uh, less drama is uh, more of, uh, you know what drama is, of course, and uh, melodrama. But here it literally means uh, less difficult, uh, upset, uh, less upset, less complication, less injury, injured feelings, and less fuss. So in other words, how to make decisions which are according to the law, to justice, to the truth, and less complicated, and not upsetting decisions. So that's the whole idea. All right, so let's go to, uh, to more. Okay, two kinds of decisions. So we make difficult decisions in life, like life-changing decisions. They can dictate your future, like a decision to marry, have children, study, career shift, religion, worldview, and higher ordination. That's one of them. <laughs> There's also easy decision. Food you are going to eat, drinks, movie, dress, or travel. Can I go to Uganda or not? So these are easy decisions. I'm not going to talk about easy decisions. I'm going to talk about very difficult decisions in life. So me, one decision in life was uh, to be ordained as a monk. I knew the whole, world, the whole Uganda is going to go against me. Can you imagine most of the decision you make, maybe the whole family go against you, but can you imagine this, this decision I became, I made it to become a monk, it was the whole country, 
going against me because I knew it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Up to now, Ugandan feel I'm crazy, actually, plain crazy. How can I leave the land and then the family and the job and all these things? They'll never understand it. <laughs> Ugandan don't get it, actually. I can tell you for sure. And, uh, of course, many times uh, they ask me a very hard question. They say, hey, Banta, yes, we understand, okay, Buddhism is great. But if you don't have children, who's, who's going to become the next monk? <laughs> it's a hard one. <laughs> I said, don't worry, I'm going to outsource. <laughs> Now we have one, actually we have one from Burma, and now in June I'm going to bring one from Sri Lanka. <laughs> actually, the first time I was asked this question, I said, maybe I actually made the wrong decision. <laughs> I would have maybe ventured maybe into putting 12 years or 20 years of life and have maybe five children, and actually it's good to have 60 children. <laughs> like, you know, the Buddha sent 60 Alahans all over the world. If I had 60, I would send mm, Uganda, mm, Chad, mm, Nigeria. <laughs> I mean, I, if I had time to plan, <laughs> if I, I knew that I would become a monk maybe uh, when I was 20, maybe that would be very good planning, actually. Very good planning. Eh? <laughs> of course, I became a monk when I was 36, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, this was a hard decision for me. And uh, at one time, uh, somebody told me, are you sure you want to go to Uganda as a monk? I said, hmm, yes, maybe. He said, he, and he was a monk. He told me, you know, they are going to kill you when you go back to Uganda. <laughs> but I said, no, don't worry. Uh, I, I said, maybe I should disrobe when I go to Uganda. And when I come back to USA, I, 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 I get my robes back. Because I now get a lot of, I will get into trouble, actually. So then my teacher told me, you know, if you disrobe, I will not ordain you again. That's the first condition my teacher gave me. If you disrobe, I'm not going to ordain you. He told me that you are from Uganda, all people are suffering there. Why don't you give it a chance, you know? After all, after all Buddhists born again and again and again and again and again. So just try this life. Anyway, I, didn't, uh, I just gave up the idea of disrobing and they go to Uganda and then come back and ordain again. I said, okay, I don't care what Ugandans are going to feel about me. So, for sure, when I went to Uganda, people looked at me as if I dropped from heaven. <laughs> people start running away, actually. There's, there's some kids, they, they say, that, that's a madman. They start running away. So, I... This is not talk about what I experienced in Uganda. Maybe I talk a talk. I give a talk actually about Dharma in, in, in planting Dharma seed. You'll know what I've gone through. Making this this decision to become a monk wasn't very easy, right? So I want to tell you why people make uh, unwholesome decisions. One fear of risks. Uh, life is already a risk actually. Those who have gained airplane, they will give you the whole rap about how is risk. How, when you, in a case of water landing, that's a crash. <laughs> they, they smoothen it instead of saying in a case of water crashing, <laughs> they say in a case of water landing. Good luck if you can land on water, 30,000. <laughs> they made us to think that's not a risk, actually. It's a risk, actually. So life is risky. So, of course, most people fear risks, but, well, even breathing is a risk. When you breathe in, do you know that you're going to breathe out? No. What guarantee do you have? Did the Buddha give you a guarantee that when you breathe in, you're going to breathe out? So every time is a risk, but people are afraid of taking risks. So we should actually not be afraid of taking risks, especially which are within our uh, Dharma, right? So we should take a, a risk of uh, trying to get into the unknown. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about uh, stupid risks. I'm talking about uh, being courageous to step into the unknown. Yeah, because m most people have a fear of unknown, right? I think it's better to talk about the unknown other than risks. People are going to say, oh, risking is not good. But I'm talking about uh, uh, life is not known, actually. In fact, they say that the only thing that is known in life is death. Death is known is sure, is certain, but life is unknown. So let us say 
uh, life is unknown instead of putting risk. You know, right? So ignorance and delusion, not knowing or knowing in a wrong way. Right? Okay, not knowing is that you don't know whether there's a snake. But actually knowing in a wrong way is seeing as a rope and thinking it's a snake. So this is the difference between ignorance and delusion. Right? Ignorance is not knowing, and delusion is knowing, but knowing, but you get it wrong. You get it in the wrong way. Uh, an example is somebody who has a cataract. One time is not seeing, that not knowing. Another time, actually, the, the person with cataracts can see, but see upside down or distortion. Okay, another thing is lack of information, disinformation, intentional falsehood, and uh, dis misinformation, unintentional falsehood. Misleading information, basically. We can make decisions because we, have, uh, we don't have enough information. Another one is aversion, anger. And when you have anger, actually anger, what it does, it suppresses the rational mind, and then you actually don't, uh, you, you don't have any rationality. And in a way, that's how the, the brain saves us from being injured. If you are touching something hot and you start rationalizing, it will burn you. So what anger does in our aversion, it suppresses our idea of rationalizing and figure out things. It just, okay, if you touch something hot, you rather think it's going to kill you and then drop it immediately. But if you say, oh, touching, touching, feeling, meditation, oh, hotness, hotness. You see, that's the instruction we get in meditation. When you, you, you feel coolness, you just become our coolness, coolness, coolness. No, not really. The brain, you touch something, it just said, no, no, you are dead now, and you drop it. So in other words, aversion, uh, anger, uh, uh, what it does actually, according to biology, it actually suppresses our rational mind. In other words, when, uh, whenever somebody says something and we get angry, no wonder we say something uh, and, uh, without knowing this is our best friend. This is our, our, our wife or husband or girlfriend, whatever. We forget. We just blow something out of anger and let alone find, oh, this is my darling. <laughs> Honey, I didn't mean to say that. But you have already said it. It suppresses our, our rationality. And then we t also we make decision out of attachment to our views. Strong attachment. You remember my talk last time? Uh, uh, last time? It was about the, how we get attached to our views strongly, and we don't want to let go. That's a big problem also. Uh, we make a decision based on our views. Power differentials in a family or a farm, in other words, an organization. So we have a structure, the CEO, president, secretary, and all these things. So and then we are, we are followers, poor followers. We just wait until people make a decision for us. So basically, there is a, a way how we can actually uh, complement and uh, uh, cooperate instead of actually always b b basing decision, uh, b uh, I mean, making decision based on power. power. So we can actually do something about it. Hastiness, acting with haste. Of course, haste uh, waste time and money and energy. So I think when I look at my decision I made uh, to jump from a roof, it was a combination of fear, a combination of aversion, and also hastiness. Yes. Uh, also, another very, very important uh, reason why people make wrong decision is called dramatic reversal. <laughs> Seeing small things as big things and vi vice versa. So most people actually have what they call optic delusion. Something small, they make it big. In Africa, we say making uh, an elephant out of a housefly. <laughs> this, uh, this is an African saying, you know. Yeah, and, and I've seen it again and again. In, 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 in small things, people take them to be very big. And big things, people take them to be small. I remember one time uh, our neighbor in Uganda uh, took a big chunk of our land, and I called him to explain why he took a big chunk of our land. You know what he told me? Oh, you have a big land, <laughs> and your land is good, you can see water. I told him, hey, build a three-story building, and you can see water the same way I see it. <laughs> so this is a big thing. I told him, this is not my land. This is a land of the temple, you see? 
So now he told me he want to see fish, you know. How can you see fish from a building, you know? Go fishing, go and learn scuba diving. You are going to stay with the fish. So I've seen it again. again the way of people actually who make small things. It's called, in the literature, we call it dramatical reversal. All right. Decision-making processes. There are six processes that I, for, I figured out that uh, I think they're going to be very important if you, are, you want to make decision. The first thing is to have a problem and a challenge. Yeah? So you have to identify. That's the first thing. You don't have to worry about that. There are so many challenges in life and problems, I think. Of, of course, the Buddha had a problem. What was the problem of the Buddha? Dukkha, suffering. I like actually that word dukkha. In fact, the word dukkha, <laughs> it shows exactly what's going on in our life, disharmony. It's not necessarily suffering, but disharmony. Disharmony. So that's dukkha, if you want the Pali word there. Problem, I call it dukkha. Find out what's dukkha. Identify it. Do, uh, I got this quote, which is very good. It's called, do not limit your challenges, but challenge your limits. So this is very, very important. Actually, we have so many, uh, um, many challenges in our life, but it's not good to confine yourself. Because most of the time we, we make uh, our, our decision, we get so much confined, right? And we, we leave out the whole world of possibilities, you know? In, 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 in I think uh, what we call uh, quantum physics, we call them end, we call it endless possibilities. So whenever there's a decision making, make sure that you you brainstorm some of other possibilities, right? Other possibilities. <laughs> Our challenges makes life interesting, but overcoming them makes it more meaningful. So again, that's a quote. That I thought it would be very interesting. Okay, the second step is to col uh, collection. That means gather information about all options you have. Uh, I call them A, B, C, X, Y, Z, right? From reliable sources and brainstorm possible options. Then weigh your decision according to short analysis. This is a business term. It's not in a Buddhist term. <laughs> that means the strength and the weakness and opportunities and threats. We don't find this term, we find it in business. That's my karma of having done uh, some business. When I went to India, I went to study business, and I turned it to, into Buddhism. So from business to Buddhism. So I learned this word, and it's very important when you're making decisions. Uh, in other words, what are the strengths of one of the decisions you're trying to make, and what's its weakness? Some decisions have strength, others have weaknesses. So you have to determine at least that. Uh, those two things are very important. In other words, what are the pros and cons? What are the advantages and disadvantages? You have to decide by yourself. Then the third is very, very important. It's called examinations. Test your options. So this is actually the problem I had when I was jumping at that, that, uh, uh, that flat, our house. I didn't test my options. I wish I knew how to test my options <laughs> because that decision, as we are going to see, is definitely didn't pass the test. And I didn't even test it. <laughs> this is the decision that didn't pass the test, and I didn't test it. So this test is based on Dharma. Uh, you, you, are, you, want, you want to find out in this test whether it's based on drama or Dharma, right? I told you what's Dharma and drama. So for instance, what are the consequences? This is called the consequence principle. How your decision is going to impact yourself, others, the society, and the environment. So in other words, jumping from a, a roof, if I just had enough time and wisdom to know how it's going to impact me, I would not jump. But I jumped because I skipped that part. <laughs> but it, it guess in our life, we skip that part. We, many, many times we skip that part. Usually we may say, oh, how it's going to affect me. But how is it going to affect others? How is it going to affect the entire community? How is it going to affect the environment? And it has to meet the criteria, the criteria. According to the Buddha, all those three criteria, they have to be met. Meeting one is not enough. Doing something knowing that, uh, uh, not, not knowing how it's going to affect others and you know it's going to affect you only, that's not a, a valid uh, decision-making process. So then we go to choice. Uh, okay, out of the three options, 
choose one. What are the three option, options? These are the options I have in my life. If not X, then Y, otherwise Z. So, uh, in other words, uh, try to see uh, all the options you have and boil down to three options you have. If I don't go to Australia, I go to Sri Lanka, otherwise Uganda. That's it. Don't make 100 options. They will be confusing and you become restless. So it's good to have options. Then uh, action. The next one, you have to take actions based on your decision. So decision, has, uh, decision uh, which has no value, uh, I mean, decision has no value except when it's put into action. You see, when I'm in Uganda, I have uh, developed a, a saying which is called NATO, N-A-T-O, no action, talk only. <laughs> so all our board members, I tell them not to, scri to subscribe to that NATO, right? So as you, when you become a board member, you have to uh, uh, make sure that you, uh, you actually act. Whatever you say, you take action. After years and I don't say action, we, we, we promote you. <laughs> Our board members are not demoted. We promote them. <laughs> when I see that you're not taking action, I take you to be advisor. So we just need, when we need you, then we call you. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> because in, in ordinary business, you, you demote people who don't work. So the net effect we have e-board members, advisors, <laughs> because they'll feel good. Because we, we, when we need you, we'll, we'll ask you some advice. So board members have to work in our temper at least. <laughs> so decision with, uh, decision, uh, this is a quote, decision without action is dead dreaming. Action without a decision uh, is a nightmare. So vision and action <laughs> uh, can change the world. That's Joel Berker. I think this is very, very important. So let's go to this last step. It's called evaluation. Evaluation, we have to evaluate the results of our decision. So in other words, we, can't, we have to evaluate. Was it good? Was it not good? Right? And then we have to change. So change is very important. It's amazing. Buddhists, they know the teaching on Anicca, but when there's changes in our life, people get scared, get even surprised, as if it's just news. Change, is it new? <laughs> no. The only thing that is, doesn't change is Nibbana. The rest is changing. So we can make decisions and allow flexibility. Right? We don't put a cast into the stone, of course. It's good to, of course, have very solid decision, but also accept that things change. And then you can do what we call adjust, adapt, and advance, right? So this is very, very important. These are, of course, the steps. You are going to have this PowerPoint if you want uh, at some stage. But the most inst important stage in all the process is the, what we call examination stage because it has four principles. These four principles are very important. Again, this is not business on, only, but this is Dharma, actually. Uh, these four principles, which are very, very important if you are a person who wants to make a decision, where, whether you are making a decision about your daughter to get married, whether you want to change a job, whether you want to believe in a new religion, whether you want to build another temple, whether you want to do donate to Uganda Buddhist Center. Here's the decisions. These are the things you have to remember. <laughs> so, uh, also, how much am I going, going to donate? All these things will become very clear when we observe these four principles. One is called instrumental principle. Another one is called consequential principle. Another one is called universalization principle. Another one is called priority principle. I decided to really give this uh, uh, an attention because these principles is what divides what's wholesome and unwholesome. You don't know, if you don't know what's between what's wholesome and unwholesome, how are you going to make the decision? We are talking about psychological difference between what's wholesome and unwholesome. Okay, what's the difference between good and bad? Is it bad according to a pop? How can you tell that this is good or bad? Who told you? This is a challenge I get in Uganda when I teach the Noble Eightfold Path. Right understanding, right thought, right this and this. 
People raise their hand. You say, who said he's right? <laughs> Actually, you see, it's so fascinating to teach for me in uh, countries like in Africa where there's no dharma, much dharma, uh, and they've never heard this, about these things. I learn a lot from people's questions. People ask me what's precepts. I, th I took it for granted for me. Yeah? People ask me what's refugees. I thought all people understand what's refugees. <laughs> it's very interesting. So the good thing about teaching in Uganda, you don't assume things. You don't assume. You know when we stay in the Dharma centers, we, we take things for granted. We even use time, I'm going to sit. Well, we know you go to Uganda, you tell them you're going to sit. It's a sitting to do what? <laughs> you know in the meditation center we, are, we say oh, we are going to sit? That means we are going to meditate. <laughs> well, in Uganda we have problems. <laughs> sitting doesn't mean meditation. In fact, many times in, in Uganda meditation means medication. <laughs> <laughs> ah, medication. No, I'm going to meditate. Uh, to meditate. Oh, you are going to medicate. What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe they're not far from the truth. <laughs> I was surprised how many people don't understand the word meditation, actually. Even the word, medi uh, uh, the word refugee brought me a lot of trouble, you know. When I was teaching, somebody was frowning all the time. I was teaching, so frowning, contours on his face. Uh, can I ask you a bunch of questions? I said, yes, please ask. What do you mean that, that uh, because she asked, uh, uh, she asked how to become a Buddhist? I like this teaching. And this, this person didn't have a religion actually, never had a religion. And then she had all this beautiful teaching from the Buddha. She asked me, Bante, how to become a Buddhist? I said, no, becoming a Buddhist is very easy. You just have to take three refugees. He said, okay. And she started listening and I was talking. She said, can I ask you another question? I said, yes, please ask. She said, but if I don't have money to feed them, <laughs> if I don't have money to feed, to feed refugees from Rwanda, <laughs> refugees from Congo, refugees from Sudan, I can't become a Buddhist. It's not easy, very difficult, a lot of money. So I was assuming all the time. So in Uganda, everything I talk is screamed, actually. So even right and wrong, people screen it. That's why I want to use the word wholesome and unwholesome. Because when we use these words, they are not having a cultural baggage. Who said right? Is it the pope? Is it the father? Is it my mother? Is it the father? Is it the monk? Who, who said it? What, what, what's the criteria? What's the criteria between right and wrong? It becomes very difficult. But not today. Today we are going to see the distinction, what we call universal goodness and universal badness which we call wholesome and awesome. We start with the instrumental principle. What's the difference? We're going to start. Okay, the first distinction is number one. Please pay attention to this. And if it's too much, please, you're exempted from listening to this talk. <laughs> you're exempted. You can go. But because I, I, don't, I don't want people to mix these things because most people mix these things, you know. So now, wholesome, something, if it's wholesome, it's going to have this principle, which is called instrumental principle. Any behavior by your body, speech, or mind, which leads to the goal, in this case, Nibbana, is called wholesome, or we call it right. That's one distinction. And on unwholesome side, I thought you people, you have a red pen, a pen, I don't know. Because I don't know whether you follow me when I'm talking. Anyway. Okay, uh, any behavior by way of body, speech, or mind that leads uh, away from the goal, Nibbana, in this case. So we can tell. But I think you have to use your mouth. This way you have to face this way. I have to face this way? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. Let me use. use ah, okay, very good. Okay, I'm here. Do you know me where I am? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You see the thing that when I talk about goal, of course, this is part of spiritual practice. But we can say, what are the goals of the organization? We can define the goal of the organization. What are the values of the family? Right? So in this, I mentioned goal, Nibbana, but you can see what are the goals of the organization. Is it profit making? Or manufacturing monks and nuns? Or whatever it is. 
build temples, build monasteries, you have to find a goal. So any behavior that leads to that goal, if it's leading away from that goal, it's unwholesome. It reminds me when I was in Uganda, we had one of our board members who did exactly the opposite of the aims and objective of the organization. Opposite, totally opposite. I promoted her. <laughs> I told you promotion. In Uganda, we don't kick people away. We don't demote them. We promote them to advisors. So we, we spend one year without even asking the advice. <laughs> so then, uh, of course, a goal, you have to define what goal, all right? So we go to another one. Is this, this, this distinction clear? So this way we can define what's unwholesome and wholesome. We go to another one, another principle. The second principle is called consequential principle. Uh, now we are going to navigate, uh, take an excursion, a little excursion into the Dhamma, uh, the sutras. There's this, a discourse called Ambala, uh, uh, Ambala Lahuro Vada Sutra, is in, in Niganikaya. I know, so, so Majmanika, you find this distinction called consequential principle. So consequential principles go like this. If the behavior by body, speech, or mind leads, leads to happiness of oneself other than both, then it's wholesome. Of course, you have to judge it according to the three times, these three times, eh? the past, present, and the future. In other words, is the, deed, the action you are doing in the past or present or future leads to one's happiness, and happiness of others and both, then it's wholesome. And uh, if on one, on one side, uh, if the behavior of the body, speech, and mind uh, leads to one suffering, others and both is unwholesome. So we, here we have even a Dhammapada phase, which said that, the, oh, sorry, sorry, Dhammapada phase. The Dhammapada 67, the deed, that co the deed that causes no remorse afterwards and the result results in joy, that's, uh, that's awesome. Another one uh, in Dhammapada, a deed, this one, the deed that causes remorse afterwards, of course, is unwholesome. Okay, based on the example I gave you, uh, when I, f I fell from the roof, where is it? Was it wholesome or unwholesome? What do you think? Unwholesome, it led to my suffering. <laughs> It left to the suffering of my father and my mom. Oh, my mom was terrified, actually. <laughs> and it led to both. <laughs> so every decision you make, subject it to this examination. You see, you drive these cars, these cars have to pass the test. You, even airplane, they have to be tested where they are, whether they are air, airworthy or not. Is it not what they do for cars also? They have to test them. Yes, so what stops you from testing the decision you're making, whether it fits this criteria or not? All right, so we go to another one, the third one, universalization principle. Uh, this is in the Dhammapada. The, the, Buddha say, the, the Buddha said that all tremble at a road, comparing others to oneself, one should not strike or, or cause to strike. So here we have two rules that you have to remember. One is called the golden rule. Actually, actually, religion have a, go, a golden rule. Uh, uh, treat others the way you want to, to, to treat yourself. Right? So this is what you call golden rule. The silver rule is more of a negative form. Do not treat others the way you do not want to treat yourself. Very simple. So any decision you are making, make sure that is, uh, the, uh, if you are making it, is, is, is this the same way you, you would like to be treated? In Uganda, when we, uh, we, uh, we were constructing a room for the guest, I was not in a country, uh, and we had a, a person who was coming. I told the person who's going to, uh, to renovate this room, go there in the room and stay there, and then find out what you are missing. <laughs> find out what you are missing. If you are missing a table, put it there. If you are missing a Colgate, put it there. Many times I've been, taking, uh, I've been asking people to renovate that room, and then they say we have finished it, but they never put themselves in the shoes. Yeah? So I found out this time, the last renovation we had for our room for guests, the person actually went there <laughs> and found out they didn't have the place to hang their clothes, and they put it there. 
they didn't have uh, the, the, the toothbrush and they put it there. Many times people have not been putting these things there. So this is very, very, very important. The Buddha mentioned this when we talk about loving kindness. Atupamaya sabbe sam satanam suka kamato pasitwa kamato meta sabbasate subhavaye. Having seen that all beings, like one self, have a desire for happiness, one methodically develops loving kindness for all beings. So in other words, you put yourself in the shoes of all other beings. No beings want to suffer. Even an insect. An insect, when it goes, walking and you block it, what happened? It goes the other way around. Well, this insect didn't go to school. Do, do, do insects go to kindergarten and, begin and learn this, they go to school? No. I don't know what, to, actually, personally, it's baffling for me to see even the smallest insect. A smallest insect, not even big one. A smallest insect. You put a stick like this, it reaches it, and go the other way around. So in other words, this is a universal principle that we have to follow. Number four. Number four is called priority principle. That again distinguishes what's wholesome and unwholesome. The first one is called atadipeteya, this one. This is a Pali word. So dis discerning action, whether they, they help uh, or, um, one con 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 Conscience, conscience, conscience. So now this is very, very important because uh, this word has the word science, which is knowledge. So knowing yourself, how you are going to discern between what's good and what's wrong, what's, what's wrong and what's uh, right. This is kind of an inner voice inside us that can tell actually when, whether you're on the right, uh, right, right track or not. This is very important. So on unwholesome, failing to discern action with the help of one who's Conscience, 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 conscience. I'm, I have a trouble with this. Conscience. Yes, yes. Okay. Now this is called. Uh, I love Pali. Pali is easier. Atta dipateya. Nothing can go wrong. Atta means the self. Pateya is more of a priority. So atta means what? Self. Yeah, so this conscience, conscience, no self. The word is no self there. <laughs> Part is easy. <laughs> okay, now, decision to kill for experiment. If, if this is, a, you are a doctor, <laughs> we have some doctors here. <laughs> so when you, okay, you have to make experiment. Well, though the, the hospital have told you to do this, but in, in, inside there, there must be something inside you. Right? So this is, you have to determine whether it's wholesome and unwholesome, right? So this is very, very important. Okay, the second one is called loca di patea. So this is a very good distinction, which is uh, uh, anything that is praised by the wise, uh, judging by public opinion, government, and law enforcement. So if some, something, the, if you do something and the wise are going to say, wow, no, no, you shouldn't have put plumber here. You shouldn't have broken this building. If the wise are there, and most of the organization have, has, have wise people, like, uh, like this organization has the local hero here, Agent Brahm, I think. <laughs> you can always refer, oh, we are going to break this building. Is it okay or not? Okay, and also you have wise people here. Part of the board members are wise. Part of your uh, stakeholders are wise. You can get a consensus. I think last time you did it, actually. I remember last time, I think the president announced, <laughs> uh, are you reading the newsletter or not? Please tell us whether actually we should continue printing them. Didn't you say that? Yes, you are trying to do this decision. Loka, the public, what's, it, what's the judgment of the public? So you see, you've been doing this decision making. I would like to see the basis. Where, where's the basis? Why are you making this announcement? Why are you not making yourself a decision? So because you want to reach an informed decision, isn't it? So this is also very important ground. Okay, this is to be, uh, on the other side, if something is to be censured by the wise, we are here. If to be censured by the wise, judging by public opinion, government, or law enforcement, this is given actually uh, Kalama Sutra. So if it's going to be praised by the wise, it's wholesome. If it's going to be censored by the wise, it's not awesome. This is very important. 
Okay, so we go to the third one. It's called Dhamma Dipatea. The ultimate yardstick of making decision is this one. This is the ultimate one. Because this can be biased. You may have the public, even a, a speech advisor may, may not be staying here. All right, okay. <laughs> the speech advisor is in path. <laughs> and you want to do something. In, in fact, many times it's like that. In, in a monastery in West Virginia, my teacher, Bante Gunaratana, want to make a decision to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to surface the, the par parking lot. All board members have never, there, uh, they have never been there in winter. It's me, we monks, <laughs> who stay in the winter there. And then the board members say, no, it's very expensive, very expensive. My teacher went ahead and put the whole thing, which cost almost 54,000 US dollars. I was one time walking with my teacher and said, Bante, I mean, big Buddha Rakita, you know, it's amazing. We have been suffering for all the last 30 years. When it snows, then we have to bring a tractor and take all the stones. And next time we have to put another stones. My teacher made a decision, right, out of the, the public opinion. That's why I said the best decision to make is this one. Make sure that it agrees with Dharma. Discerning action, action according to Dharma Vinaya. Does it agree with the Dharma? We are here. Does it agree to, with the Dharma or disagree with the Dharma Vinaya? In other words, does it agree to, with the truth, what the Buddha taught? Is it serving the purpose of what the Buddha taught? You have to check with the truth, Dharma. Right? I think that's the four things there. So let us make a case study. Sorry. We have to go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now there's a problem. <laughs> Big problem. How to go back? <laughs> Figure it out. Okay. I'll give you an example. One time, figure out and then we find out the case study, which is going to summarize it, and then we're going to have Q&A. So now, uh, decision in life, whether you make a decision of, uh, let's say, taking a course, right? Or taking a decision to get married, right? And then later on we find it's a, that's not your best choice. What are you going to do? You are with the, the person the rest of your life, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> if you decide to, uh, maybe to, oh, that's, yeah, that's a case study. If you decide to do a course, let's say doctor, the rest of your life you're a doctor. It's very difficult to change. Eh? It's very difficult to change. So now, my friends, if you find out you made a bad decision, you have to change your attitude. You have to change your attitude. Let's say, uh, uh, we, we have to agree that, okay, we, to error is a human, eh? and to forgive is divine. I'm quoting from a Christian background. To err is a human, and forgive is divine. Can we forgive ourselves, and not kicking ourselves around because we made a bad decision? Most people kick themselves around, and say, you know, ah, they swear, they, oh yeah, I would not have made this decision, you know. It has costed the entire my life. No, no, don't worry. This life is only 100 years. Other life will maybe last 1 million years. You don't know. So don't worry. In this life, if you made a bad decision and you cannot change it, just stick in there. Just do what you can to change. And if you can't change, just adapt. Be loving, be kind, be happy. So adapting is very, very important. I mentioned it last time. You have to adapt, right? So then, uh, of course, I want also to, make, uh, to put a little bit of a footnote here. To make a decision according to all these principles, you must be way up there, very wise, and probably a little bit enlightened. <laughs> because uh, it's not so easy to really get, meet all these criteria. But, and but, can we make that as a template for making decisions? Is it not good to have some template than just randomly making decisions here and there? I told you I've made many decisions in my life randomly. Randomly. I've done it. One time I was uh, in, in Thailand, uh, uh, then uh, no, I was in Nepal, and then I went to Tibet. And when I was in Tibet, I met an Australian. He's called Mark. He was, English Australia, uh, was from England but lived in Australia. I told him I'm going to India. Uh, he told me, why are you going to India? I said, oh, you know, I'm going to pick up my book and go home. You know, he told me, go, uh, uh, first he asked me, how are you going to in India? 
I told him I'm going to raft through Nepal and go through the uh, national park. He told me, no, 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 no. Go to Thailand. Go to Thailand and you become a scuba diving instructor. And you're going to love it. Guess what? I just followed him. I followed him. I changed, I changed my plans. Instead of going to India through Nepal, I just got an air ticket to go to, to Thailand. And guess what? I was on, a, I, uh, on this uh, ocean for the first time in my life. On a boat. Rough seas. I'm telling you, the first time I went on the ocean, I regretted. I got seasickness. It was raining. The, the, the boat engines uh, stopped running. And I started holding on to the rack. And it broke. And then the, the captain didn't know the direction where to go on the island. We kept on drifting, drifting, drifting. I'm telling you, it was a horrible experience. I wish that I didn't follow Marcus' advice to go to do diving. <laughs> I didn't know even what seasickness. I felt terrible, and I didn't know what's under the water. I reached the island, very sick, and all these things. I took somebody's advice. I didn't examine it. <laughs> now I became a diver, and I was stuck on the island for two years. Can you imagine just making a decision like that? I spent on the island for two years as a scuba diving instructor. That before you came a monk, in case you, you don't think I was a monk. <laughs> don't think I was a monk. <laughs> and that changed the course of my life. It took me two years to realize, no, please, this is not the end of the world. Go and follow your path. Because that time I had meditated in India for 12 days, I said, no. I made a decision and to, to go back to meditation. And I remember very well, the people I told them that I'm going back to Uganda, they told me, you, you must go to a psychiatric. How can you leave your job? They, told, they thought I have a mental problem, actually, because it's such a nice job. I said, no, I have to leave. So I made a decision. Guess what? I went to, uh, to Uganda. Then after that, I, went in, I, I ended up in South America. Then I went to USA to meditate for three months. And then I went to Burma uh, to meditate for two months. When I finished the retreat, one person told me, Venerable, I had you in Kopipi Island. People are dead. They had tsunami there. So in other words, if I didn't make a decision to leave Thailand, I will not be giving this Dhamma talk. <laughs> Can you imagine? Just a simple decision like this, it saved my life. I will be stuck on the island. You know, most people actually, the, my instructor was from Canada. He went there just for one month and he stayed there for 10 years. So in other words, island, the island called PP Island, it keeps on growing on you. It keeps on growing on you. So you better know what you may, your decision are. It can make you life, save your life. Okay, let's go to a case study of ethics. This is called Bahitika Sutta, again in Majmanika. Maj, Maj, so these are just a case study. I'm just going to go very fast. So, so one is psychological aspect. And uh, uh, another one is skillful, um, let's say uh, unskillful. Let me just show you this one. This one. Skillful. This is skillfulness or wholesomeness. So we have to look how the, our decision affects our health of the mind and the body, of course. Uh, if it's unskillful, it's unhealthy for our mind. Right? It's unhealthy for our mind and body, of course. So potential results, chemically. If it, re it brings happy results, then it's wholesome. If it is bring painful results, it's unwholesome. So what about mot motivation aspect? Good intention. What are the intentions behind your, uh, uh, your decision making? Is it generosity? Is it compassion and wisdom? Or is your, of course, if it meets this criteria, then it's wholesome. So if it's a bad intention, greed, hatred, and illusion, then it's unwholesome. Another one is worthness. Is it praiseworthy or blameworthy? So your decision, if it's praiseworthy, then it's wholesome. If it's uh, blameworthy, then it's unwholesome. That's why we say, sadu, 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 after your, your donation. Because we praise it, isn't it? If this, uh, people say, no, no sadu, no sadu, no sadu, then it's not. <laughs> Guess what? I tell you, the Buddha gave discourses. There is one discourse where the monks were not delighted. <laughs> Can you imagine? 
It's called, uh, the, it's, it's, I think it's the second discourse. It's called uh, Mola Pariyaya Sutta. Mola, Mola. It's, it's the second discourse. The discourse on uh, uh, the roots. In English, it's called the discourse on the roots. The, the monks were not delighted. All the discourse, the, the monks said, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> this is what we call praiseworthy, right? Because Sadhu means well done, well done, well done. I hope that's what you are going to say at the end of my talk. <laughs> okay, fifth. Fifth, wrong range consequences. Does it lead to happiness to oneself, others, and both? Or does it lead to suffering of oneself, others, and both? So, my friend, that's a case study. So, having discussed the differences between wholesome and wholesome states of, of mind and their relationship with decision-making process, it becomes abundantly clear that sound decision making hinges on the way we understand the differences between unwholesome and un unwholesome mind states, states of mind. I, hope, I offer this for your reflection. Thank you very much for listening.